The Lord was shattered in the cedars. The Lord shattered the cedars of Lebanon. He made Lebanon look like a man. They look like ordinary people, but they're Catholic missionaries. They've come to some of the most inhospitable parts of the globe to win souls for Jesus and to alleviate poverty. Only very special reasons would make someone choose this life. Here, there is no electricity or drinking water, medical care or respect for human life. War has become the norm. We look at the conditions missionaries face in Central Africa, in unstable political situations, often working in rebel areas with no state infrastructure. We uncover their higher calling. Mariel Lu is a village in South Sudan, where there are thousands of refugees from the civil war, which has divided the country for over 15 years. The village is not on any map. It was built only two years ago as a safe haven for those who fled attacks by the Arabic Sudanese army. During the rainy season, Mariel Lu becomes an island surrounded by swamps. For six months every year, it's an inaccessible place which can only be reached by air. The weather and the geography have kept Mariel Lu safe from the war, far removed from the bombs, but staring poverty right in the face. This is where a 50-year-old missionary, Dorinda Kuna, lives. Dorinda has been in Mariel Lu since the mission was created two years ago. She spent over 20 years in Sudan. Her first mission was in the north. She was expelled from there when the Sudanese government decided to forcibly convert the mostly non-Muslim population to Islam. Now, Dorinda lives with those who resisted in an area controlled by the SPLA rebels, the Sudanese People Liberation Army. Why did you choose this way of life? It's difficult to say why, but what I've experienced in my life is that happiness doesn't come when we have everything in life. <laughs> happiness is when we feel that someone needs us and that we can do something for them. So, it's not to run away from problems, but to face them with other people. Back in 1996, the Democratic Republic of Congo was still called Zaire. That year, the guerrillas who fought against the Mobutu dictatorship attacked the village of Bondo in the northern Equateur province. Two years later, in August 1998, the village was attacked again, this time by the guerrillas who fought against Kabila's regime, the autocratic ruler who replaced the former dictator. Today, Bondo village is under a rebel army, controlled by this man. Jean-Pierre Bemba, a businessman who has houses in Belgium and Portugal. Bemba drew a huge crowd when he visited Bondo for the first time. His audience lapped up his promises of a better life and the freedom to live with dignity and without oppression. How did a businessman become a warlord? It's a question I'm asked frequently. But to tell you the truth, it was after looking with sadness at how people in my country were living, at Kabila's regime, 
which was supposed to replace an unjust dictatorial regime, which was tribal and stole state assets. As far as I'm concerned, I wanted for nothing. But I could see that people around me had nothing. Nothing to eat every day. Not a cent for health care. It really was difficult to ignore people's misery. Especially if you consider that this is mainly a failure of the system. That's what revolted me and gave me the impetus to create a revolution in our country. Freedom means that our roads are no longer dotted with checkpoints, like during Kabila's time. Every hundred meters you would find a checkpoint to search people's bags, to search people's trousers and to steal their money. All of that is over. People are free to move around again. They've regained their dignity. We don't hassle people anymore. We don't arrest people just to obtain information. People are free to circulate. There's no longer a curfew. People were forced to go home at 6 p.m. because there was a 6 p.m. curfew. I believe we now have freedom, dignity, and what's more, we've regained security. As far as the economy is concerned, economic activities have restarted. People can sell their own coffee and are no longer robbed by Kabila's forces, which used to loot all the coffee and people's food. We've put an end to all of that. Commerce is happening again. Early the next morning, missionary Alfredo Neres jumps on his bike and rides for two hours towards Nzabilo, the parish where he takes mass every Sunday. The first missionaries took European culture and language to Africa through their Bibles. Their usefulness as civilizers was recognized early on by the colonial powers. At the end of the 19th century, Christian missionaries in Congo were accorded specific protection under law. The warlord's words from the previous day are still ringing in Alfredo's ears. He knows those words have already traveled through the forest and reached the surrounding villages. But if people find salvation in the community of God, they can be inured from political strife. Christian missionaries work on every continent, but it could be argued that in Africa, due to the widespread failure of democracy to take root, they face their biggest challenges. That's why Alfredo's in such a rush to spread his own version of salvation. He's seen successive Congolese regimes let ordinary people down. We have gone from one dictatorship to another. We have not yet managed to establish democracy like everyone wants. We still haven't seen democracy. What's been happening, going from Bambutu to Kabila, to the current situation, from one dictatorship to another, is still oppression. They're oppressors, all of them. When a new group arrives, they oppress us, just like the ones before did. Many days walk from here, but still in the Democratic Republic of Congo, we found Claudino Gomez, 52 years old, and the third missionary in this story. He lives in a small village, which is not on any map, in the eastern province of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Bambilo, a few dozen huts, a very basic medical center, a school with nothing but a great will to teach and to learn. It's not much, but these men have only been here for seven months, the first white men ever to inhabit this region. Children have been drawn into the war in the DRC. The conflict is as complicated as it is intractable. Three